Welcome back to the Milwaukee Market Update. We're covering real estate news and data and breaking it down to help you understand how it impacts your real estate decisions. Teaser is Airbnb demand collapsing and its impact on Milwaukee. What to take away from this episode? Where is housing inventory headed next? What does a competitive offer look like in today's market? What to watch on interest rates? And why for Ty's next Costco run is eating bulk sizes of the Gabagool. <laughs> we're, we're here to give you the info you need to make the right decisions regarding your real estate. Should I buy a home now? Should I be selling? Is the housing market about to crash? Are these headlines I'm reading, content I'm seeing on social media true or even relevant to me? If you're new to the show or returning because you've found value in our previous videos, it would mean the world to us if you could take a second to subscribe. You can follow us at Tyash31 and Nick Harrington28 and reach out via info at houseworkscollective.com. I'm Ty. I'm Nick. With Houseworks Collective Compass, your local real estate experts. Let's start with our quick tips. Buyers, what do you have? Yeah, my quick tip for buyers is when you're walking through that home for the first time, treat that like a soft inspection. And if you don't feel like you're knowledgeable enough to know what to look for, be sure you're working with an agent that does understand what inspectors are going to look at. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's going to be things that will come back on any inspection report, but use that time to test your water pressure, look at your furnaces, mm -hmm. look at your water heater, look at your roof, yep. look at your foundation, and just make sure that you have a good understanding of the condition of that home. Because what we've been doing a lot recently when writing offers to get them accepted is we're softening that inspection contingency. Yep. And so I think it's very important that you might only get to be in that home for a half hour. You're making a very important decision in a quick amount of time based on today's current market. Yep. And the more that you can do to first off, understand if you like the home, but do your due diligence while you're in there to see, does everything work? Mm -hmm. And if not, what will I expect to come back on that inspection report? I think it's going to better set you up throughout the transaction and also just maybe check out and check off homes that you know right away this isn't a good buy for me too yep totally agree i think uh if you're not if you're just getting like the cosmetic uh rundown from your agent and not necessarily getting that visual inspection with them and the narration of it or maybe you calling out and asking questions and getting the answers you need you might be needing to be asking for more from your agents uh move over to our homeowners uh this is something i've seen before in past transaction is get your ac serviced you know, we're here in the middle of the summer and rotate between years. Every other year go AC to furnace, AC to furnace of getting them serviced. Big reason why is service history means a lot as the age of your mechanicals gets older. A lot of times you go in there and if you have no history of service and it's a 30 year old unit, you're going to have some buyers really turning an eye at that and being like, man, that's a 4000 to $8,000 expense and they've literally never serviced it as it's going to go out. I mean, the next few months of my home ownership. Just get the services started. There's a lot of great companies out there that can do that for you. And how much does a service cost? It can range. Uh, sometimes there's actually some subscriptions you can do. I would say you can probably get a good service and tune up for about 200 bucks. Nice. Yeah, definitely worth doing just to have that documented uh, records of what you've actually done with your unit. Because when we're there as agents, we want to tell the story of the home, like you just said in that soft visual inspection mm -hmm. we're going through. If you look at the furnace and it looks old and there's literally no service history, you're going to be like, it looks old and also it looks like it's never been serviced ever. So yeah. like you're telling that narrative and that's like a comprehensive, like what's the story of this home? And if you're the type of homeowner that does annual servicing, you know, rotating between the two, you're probably the type of homeowner that fixes leaks, you know, does repairs to their homes over time. And you're going to have less of that deferred maintenance items that come up on your home inspection. Yeah. I, uh, kind of like off topic here, but I think I really believe there's a story to every home. Yeah. You know, I tell almost every single client, that and they kind of look at me like I'm a crazy house whisperer. Yeah, but I feel like we have to be to be yeah. successful agents here. But there really is a story to every home, and it's those little details like that, mm -hmm. where if you look at a furnace and it's rusted mm -hmm. and, and it's clear that no one's ever taken care of this, yep. that's probably going to be what's true for the entire rest of the home. Yeah, and the opposite is so true too. If you have yep. someone that it's meticulously been maintained, mm -hmm. home is probably in good condition. Yep, totally agree, and then. Investors, what do you have for our investor clients out there? Yeah, I work with a lot of clients that are trying to flip houses. Mm -hmm. And here in Milwaukee specifically, I would say it's getting more and more difficult to find flip properties and flip deals that are listed on the MLS. And what I mean by that is most of the time, anything that's listed on the MLS, the rehab that you need to put into it 
your margins are so thin when you go to sell it that it's typically not a good deal. Yep. And if you're thinking about flipping homes, you flip homes already, I would say the MLS will be like a, a it's kind of like old trusty. It's always going to be there to find deals, but I would recommend and urge you to find additional ways to come across flip opportunities. Mm -hmm. The big one to me is going to be working with wholesalers, getting yep. connected with local wholesalers. Typically those are priced at a bit more of a margin, more risk involved. There's a lot less due diligence you can do with something that's a wholesaler versus listed on the MLS. Yep. But to me, that's where the better deals are going to be. And also get in the routine if you're looking to find flips that it's a volume game. For yep. every 10 offers you write, typically you're lowballing, mm -hmm. you might not get any accepted. And yep. that's just kind of the nature of the game of being in the flip space right now here in Milwaukee. Yeah, totally agree. It's, uh, I think everyone right now is struggling to find uh, those amazing deals out there. But good advice. It is all about just the numbers game and the, the, the funnel of uh, how many opportunities, exactly. how many showings you go on, and how many offers you write. That's perfect. All right, now let's go ahead and dive into our local market stats uh, through the MLS. Starting with new listings, 2,000 listings down 22% to last year. Pending sales, 570 homes up 15% to last year. That's actually kind of a weird uh, number to see there that all of a sudden we got all of these pending homes mm -hmm. and accepted offers. That's like a, that kind of stands out to me on this chart. Uh, then we've got closed homes. 1600 down 22 percent very much in line with new listings days on market we're at 17 days versus 16 days a year ago i think it's funny before you continue that's a six and a half percent increase but <laughs> yeah. it's just a day difference yeah that's right just because the numbers are so you know uh Tight tragically and small. low median sales price three hundred and fifty thousand, up eight percent almost from a year ago of three hundred and twenty five thousand. so if you bought a home a year ago You've got uh, $25,000 extra equity now in your pocket. Average sales price, 405000 up 7%. Original list price received, 103.6 versus 104.1% a year ago. Very much in line. Uh, where I think we see right now the national average is somewhere close to right about 100% of list price received. Inventory of homes, 2500 down 24% to a year ago, very much in line with the sales that we're seeing as well. And then months of supply, 1.6 months of supply, uh, flat to a year ago, also at 1.6 months. So we run through this, a lot of the narratives we have are the same. Again, there's kind of that weird outlier of pending sales actually being pretty positive compared to a year ago, mm -hmm. but really just diving into new listings because that continues to be probably the main headline that we have going on right now. 2,000 listings last month, that is the highest month of new listing activity since July of last year. So we went 11 months of not having at least 2,000 listings available, down 21%. The rolling 12-month average is down 21%. It's just crazy how there's just not as much newness coming to the market. And we've continued to see just that active inventory flatline. Anything that like you've observed out there just like on the boots on the ground yeah well i would say here just looking at these numbers new listings i do like seeing this large increase of new listings from last month to yep. this month granted month over like month. year over yep. year we're down 21 percent. we're down 23 percent year to date from last year mm -hmm. but i do like this new influx of inventory that's hit i think it's going to help to create just a more normal market but then as we look at inventory of homes for sale that is still relatively flat yep. which to me what that means is that new listings are going up, but they're getting scooped up really quickly. Yep. And so we still have kind of like a flat number of homes that's available for sale. Mm -hmm. We kind of spoke about this too. N new listings that are priced well, that are clean. You will look at those photos. It kind of has that wow factor where yep. you're like, this looks like a great home. Those aren't sitting long, like mm -hmm. one to two days. And that has not changed. But then you have old inventory that's been sitting around. Yep. And so it, to me, like the, the discrepancy between new listings and inventory of homes for sale, it, that's kind of like eye catching to me as well, too, because there's a big yeah. difference there. I, I think if we try to relate it to the pending, it's like we actually had a good amount of inventory come up month over month, like you said, and it got snatched up right away. I think that's a good, healthy indicator of the demand is still out there. Absolutely. That as soon as we saw like an uptick in month to month over month demand, that's one of our, you know, craziest upticks. I mean, what was the pending over the last few months? I don't even know if I dropped that in there, but like typically we're not seeing that big of an increase. We've seen that usually pending sales is a lagging measure based on the new, new listings inventory. we get. Yep. So very interesting to see. 
Um, then related to new inventory or active inventory available out there, the flat line continues. We essentially have not broken 2,500 listings since, I guess, November of last year, which is very rare to see because what we used to see back in pre-COVID timeframes, we used to hover somewhere around 5,000 listings in the year of 2019. That's where we kind of saw uh, the peak of 2019. And we used to see higher peaks even further back in the years from there. You just kind of hit on this again. Some of the active inventory that's out there is just not as fresh, mm-hmm. but the new good listings are getting snatched up as soon as possible. Again, down 24% in active inventory. And then median sales price, again, very similar to the narratives of what we've talked about before. If we have low new listing uh, activity, low inventory, and we still see a healthy demand, which we just saw in the past month from pending, uh, you know, offers going pending, we're going to continue to see this median sales price go up. Again, 350000 is our median sales price here in the Milwaukee four-county area, up 8% to last year. And the rolling 12 months is up 9% versus a year ago. Uh, again, we're seeing that $25,000 in equity gain. So if you made the decision, you felt like you were crazy buying last year, which June last year, nationally speaking, was I think right around where it peaked nationally. Mm-hmm. I think we kind of trailed the, the market a little bit. If you bought it, what everyone was saying was, shoot, you topped the market, you're now up 25K in equity here in our greater area. Anything you you can note here on median sales price? I would say like being in the field, the boots on the ground, working with clients, this is exactly what we kind of see every single day. Yeah. Where I work with a combination of investors and single family buyers. Mm-hmm. And yeah, those single family homes get scooped up right away. Um, prices are still very competitive for buyers. Offers that are getting accepted for single family homes that are clean are well over asking. Even homes that aren't clean, that would be considered at one point a flip property, there's still a bidding war for those too. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of this, it's very true to what I see day to day with increased prices, competitive offers, um, and just anything that I do feel for a lot of the buyers that I work with where they'll text me two days after something hits the market like, hey, I just saw this. Can we go check it out? By the time I schedule the showing for that afternoon, they already have an accepted offer and we haven't yep. even had a chance to get in there. Um, so this is all very, I mean, it's it's data. It, of yep. course it's accurate, but it, it's very reflective to what we just see here every single day. Yeah, and uh, officially new all-time highs for the Milwaukee, Milwaukee greater area for our four-county area here, 350000 Last year, our peak month of uh, of price was 325 Wow. So that's a, a new all-time high in yep. terms of median sales price. Uh, transitioning for investor listeners out there to the two family inventory or duplexes here in Milwaukee County, uh, starting with our median sales price, $212,000 up almost 15% versus a year ago. And I think that's something that we actually saw last month as well. Anything that goes out there, it is getting snatched up immediately. Median days on market in the duplex space is five days, less than a week is the median, meaning, and I know I've seen it personally, just anecdotally of you'll have something listed and it probably has an accepted offer in the first 48 hours. Just kind of like you said, in the single family space, Mm -hmm. moving super quickly, the absorption rate or the months of supply is sitting at 1.8 months versus 1.7 months a year ago. So not a whole lot of change going on there. It's a slight uptick, very, very slight in terms of like what the year to date trends are of, you know, Uh, 1.2 months of supply is what we've kind of had year to date. So a little bit more inventory, but a lot of times that's just because there's some lurking inventory that's dragging that down. Specifically looking at our active inventory new listings. So active duplex listings, 250 homes down 24% two year ago with new listings, 200 homes down 25%. This is actually an improvement from when we were talking about this earlier this year, where I think we kind of uh, bottomed out at like down 40 to down Mm -hmm. 50% of inventory. So feels like we have a little bit of newness, but also at the same time, we've just had such low inventory for like the last 12 to 18 months that we're just comparing to lower lows. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. And um, it's interesting too. I've definitely seen the price increase for new listings for duplexes there. because Most of my business is working with investors. Yep. I think like 90% of my transactions have been duplexes. And so I'm very tuned into that market. Yeah. And a duplex that used to be priced at 120 to 130 four months ago mm-hmm. is now 150 to 160. And I've kind of had to update 
live how I communicate with my clients because of this. Because if we were having this conversation four months ago, yeah, I typically say 150 is kind of that number where you can get a cash flowing duplex mm -hmm. that is going to be pretty turnkey, I would yep. say, just depending on the area location, obviously. Um, and that number has crept up quite a bit. And it, it's interesting to see those conversations change real time because I think most investors come to us saying, I'm looking for a deal under 150,000 because it's just like a very clean it's easy. number. Yeah. But like the the old 150 is now 175. Exactly. And that's the price growth that we're seeing. We're seeing, you know, similar things in, uh, you know, neighborhoods or cities like West Dallas that have, you know, have been on a tear. And it used to be, a, man, yeah, you could get almost 1% rule for 200,000. And now that's now you can maybe get 1% rule at 250. Mm -hmm. Like rents are going up as well, but they're not going quite as fast up as the, the median prices are there in the West Dallas market. Yeah. And I think too, what this says to me is people are willing to pay a premium for duplexes in specific areas. Yeah. Uh, West Dallas specifically, Wabatosa, always there's been a premium yeah. there. Bayview, same thing, where people are okay with not seeing the amount of cash flow that they used to at one point just mm -hmm. to have a duplex to ride that long term appreciation have enough cash flow for it to make sense. Um, I think this is very reflective of that too. I think most people are buying deals defensively where if they're break even to just a little bit of cash flow, they know they're not gonna be financially independent based off of $50 a month cash flow or 200. That's so negligible in terms mm -hmm. of the numbers. I think most people are looking at the long term of what does my refinance look like three to five years down the road where I'm probably going to continue to get equity in my investment. But at the same time, can I get maybe a one to one and a half percent interest rate that's better and actually get better cash flow mm -hmm. just through just long term hold, managing it, fixing it up and just participating in the market? Yep. I think that's what most uh, savvy investors are doing today. And then finally, sold listings. Um, this is actually kind of interesting. We're seeing down 43 uh, percent in sold duplex listings, uh, pending listings down 64 percent. Usually, again, these are kind of lagging measures of the inventory we had. We were kind of suppressed in inventory a few months ago. I'd be surprised. I would not be surprised to see this improve over the next Definitely. couple of months now that there's a little bit more inventory floating out there um, and see where it is. Again, we can always kind of see under the covers. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see the chart that we pull up. A lot of the you know decrease in the sales that we're having right now is actually in some of the, the lower price point goods. I know that we had a ton of portfolio sales that actually happened last year, just globally in our market. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those were at the sub, uh, you know, median price point level. So I think we're actually starting to lap that where you're seeing some of these sales not come to fruition, where there are portfolio sales, multiple deals being taken off market at one yep. point in time. Yeah. <clears throat> so overall, I know we kind of touched on a piece of these right here. What are some of the local anecdotes that we're getting for buyers, for sellers, uh, for investors in terms of, you know, average offers per listing, percent over asking, days before we get accepted offers and contracts that win? Give yeah. me give me an idea of what you're seeing for uh, investors right now. For investors, I would say a lot of that's going to vary depending on days on market. Yep. And again, kind of goes back to the wow factor. What's a, what's a high day on market home. for you right now? 14 days. 14 <laughs> days is a high yeah. day on market where if yeah. there's a duplex sitting at 14 days, we're probably writing at asking or slightly below. Yep. Um, and again, like it, we, I, I talk about the wow factor mm -hmm. where it's like if you're seeing photos of a duplex that looks clean, that's priced competitively, mm -hmm. that's going to sit on the market for two days. Yep. Um, and so the winning offer is going to vary dependent a lot on the days on market. Yep. Um, that's really going to drive a lot of the conversations that I'm having with investors. Also, how much many offers are in hand. Um, I think it's it's a difficult conversation. I get this from almost every client is like, well, what should we offer? Mm -hmm. You know, and I never I always try to put that back on the client because yep. at the end of the day, whether you're an investor or someone that's buying a single family home, I can't tell you what that home is worth to you. Yep. You know, that's something and for how your you monthly to payment determine. looks or how your cash flow looks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but I'll say the buyers that are finding success are ones that are hitting me up every single day. You know, that yeah. those are the ones that are finding homes because offers are getting accepted. You and I are both getting offers accepted, yeah. but we're doing so with the buyers that are diligent and that are committed and great to partners. finding yeah. their homes. Um, and so I think that's very important too, is that it, it, this relationship is it's very much 50-50 mm -hmm. where if you are committed to finding a home, you will absolutely find a home, yep. but you have to be committed to it. And if yep. you're like one foot in, one foot out, you're probably not gonna have as much success as someone that is like looking at their search every single day, whether it's a single family property, a condo, or mm -hmm. a duplex. Um, if we go back to these duplex stats, yeah. a lot of investors that I work with that are out of state, 
they um, I, I i kind of speak about milwaukee in terms of why a lot of out-of-state investor investors are attracted to milwaukee one of them is just the quantity of duplexes that we have here in milwaukee yeah. and i think i've spoke to this on this podcast before but Milwaukee is the third most quantity of duplexes yep. per city after New York and Chicago, yep. which is amazing. If you think about New York and Chicago being top five populations in the U.S., then Milwaukee right. 35th, yeah. 20% of Milwaukee residents live in duplexes, mm -hmm. the highest percentage of any city. Mm -hmm. And so I have a lot of investors that'll be like, why are people selling these cash flowing duplexes? Am I making a, hor am, am I making a horrible decision? And it's like, well, we're like, man, I wish it was cash flowing more. Yeah. I just used to see them. And yeah. also there's just a lot of inventory for duplexes in Milwaukee in general. And so even though that inventory is down in the duplex space, it feels like it, but it also doesn't. Because yeah. if you do a duplex search in Milwaukee, mm -hmm. you have a hundred plus units available for sale. And you compare that to just about any other market in the US, that's gonna be significantly more duplex inventory than any other market too. Yeah, and I, th I think if I just make a quick correlation to what we're seeing out there. So we had, if I go back to MLS stats and active, inventory we have 2000 listings out there in the four county area and only about 200 or so active listing duplexes it's only about 10 percent of our inventory but you said it's 20 percent of like where what housing's provided to our market so that's actually another correlation of we're seeing yes it's like a higher amount of uh inventory relative to people who don't live here in the area, but it's a lower percentage of our total inventory of what we're used to seeing. Mm, good point. And that's why we're seeing double the price growth. Yeah. Like there should be more out there relative to the, how many exist. And I think that's because people understand the gold that they have in their hands. If they've got a stabilized duplex that's bringing in cash flow at potentially a 4% or lower rate. Yeah. So it's still great that we've got more inventory out there for other investors looking to, you know, have their long-term holds, but yeah, <laughs> wish there was more out there for sure. Um, what are you seeing as far as like, your take in the market, working with mm -hmm. buyers, investors? Kind of like what have you seen this last month here? The, the the same thing is continue in terms of like you know the average offers per listing. It kind of depends. It ranges anywhere from five to twenty. And if it's the sexiest home that you've seen in a while, it's probably gonna be closer to twenty. If there's a home that maybe has a project or two, like a kitchen or a bathroom. You're going to see it be closer to that five offers range, but there's still people very excited about it. Percent over asking, it's definitely ranging anywhere from five to ten percent with a lot of the first-time home buyers I represent. If you dive under the covers, that price point of like four hundred thousand dollars and less is way more competitive because it's way more obtainable for more people, especially as a lot of people that had pre-approvals at the five hundred to six hundred fifty thousand have realized, oh, maybe I'm not quite ready for that with today's interest rates. I'll just lower my price range down further. Mm -hmm. So we're having more competition at those lower uh, lower end of our, or I guess closer to the median price point, which makes sense in yeah. the Milwaukee market. Contracts that win today, I would say it's that good offer price over asking, which is that marketing price. We're still backing up with comparables. Like I'm still mm -hmm. finding that at least one home has been somewhat close when I'm helping advise my clients of, Let's look at comparable search nearby. Is there something similar that's somewhat close? It's probably going to be we're paying more than what that person paid for. Definitely. But there's at least some data out there for the appraiser because we have not been running to appraisal issues recently. Mm -hmm. And the other side of that is the inspection not to request amount has become even more competitive. We used to kind of average between not to buy or not to request any defects less than 5000 to 10000 I'm starting to see that $10,000 be a little bit more than norm. Yep where they're essentially saying we're okay if uh, one you know slightly bigger issue maybe pops up and we've put ourselves in the financial position to correct that after closing. But if two things come up, we are actually seeing negotiations of credits or price or repairs mm -hmm. after that because the seller understands if I have two big things and I go back to the market and I have to disclose that, I'm going to be better sticking with this buyer and just doing some negotiation. Yep. So we're protecting them, their interests, but also making sure that we're protecting their earnest money and getting them the home that they want. But we're having those conversations of, are you prepared to fix an issue if it yep. comes up? Love it. That's what we're seeing out there for, you know, buyers. I mean, sellers, if you, if you can help, if we can help you find the next home, it's competitive out there, but like you can cash in. Yeah. Like we're seeing the year over year, even if you bought a year ago, you've probably already covered all your costs to sell and you're probably walking away with money. If you have a change of circumstance or anything else, I would not be too concerned on that. No, no, it's uh, I think when you spoke to this earlier, when you said people that bought last year in June, bought at like the peak and already prices have corrected up. 
Yep. I am working with a buyer right now who's got a couple of duplexes under contract. Yep. Um, this woman bought a portfolio last year, ended up in a position where I don't think she truly realized the nuances of Milwaukee inventory mm-hmm. and what that brings and deferred maintenance that yep. a lot of these duplexes have. She bought five duplexes last year. This is kind of a sad story. She bought five duplexes last year and then is now selling all of those duplexes, mm-hmm. which I think is like a, it's a good case study i think for anyone that is a young not young but like a new investor that thinks that you can just buy five properties they're going to cash flow you don't have to touch them Mm -hmm. but she's pricing most of these at a 20 percent increase last year to this (laughs) year so you know like she had cash flow coming in she's selling these at 20 percent increase which most of them will probably go around there maybe 15 maybe 10 percent but like she's still going to end up Breaking even to up a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and lucky market timing for sure. But yeah. yeah, crazy what we're seeing out there. Otherwise, taking a quick pause, what other stats are you looking for more information on? Ask us in the comments below, and we'd love to get your take on uh, what's coming next here in the real estate market. Otherwise, we can dive into the kind of news headlines portion and what's going on here in the Milwaukee area. What did would you uh, dig up this month, Nick? Yeah, so this was an article that talked about Airbnb revenue. Okay. Um, and the change of revenue by city year over year. And this came out on Twitter probably three, four weeks ago. Yep. This went around like wildfire. My girlfriend actually sent me this article. And the yep. next day in our weekly team meeting, we have a lender named Bo. Yep. Um, shout out Bo, who yep. shared this article. Yep. And so basically- this I think pretty much every podcast I've listened to has you know, called us talked out about this. Yep. So basically it breaks down the decline of Airbnb revenue by major cities. And it talks about Phoenix, Arizona, their Airbnb revenue is down 47%, Austin, Texas down 46%. Um, And if I just go down the list, Myrtle Beach, San Antonio, Asheville, Nashville, Denver, Breckenridge, New Orleans. And so basically what this article continues to talk about is there's this massive decline of Airbnb revenue in a lot of these major Mm -hmm. hub cities. And to the point, there's now more Airbnb listings available than homes listed for sale and he continues to talk about the next major collapse home crisis is going to be these investors that have bought airbnbs with the potential to make a lot of money yeah all of a sudden now phoenix arizona down 47 percent in revenue they're going to start selling these properties there's going to be a massive influx of inventory. inventory to the market which is going to depreciate home value in some of these markets that's already seen price mm-hmm. depreciation like yep. phoenix and austin texas nationally have made news because prices have softened 10 to 20 percent in those markets already without this influx of airbnb data and so it's going to be interesting to see what happens here if we peek under the covers though in this yeah milwaukee airbnb revenue year over year is up five percent and so we talk a All lot right. about milwaukee being insulated from a lot of these national stories that you hear about where home prices are going down not in milwaukee rental prices are going down not in Milwaukee. Airbnb revenue is going down, not, not in Milwaukee. Milwaukee. And yeah. so it's very interesting to me. Um, I'd love to hear like your take on this and maybe like why you yeah. think some of these markets are declining so much. Do you believe these numbers? I, I would say I, I've heard podcasts where people have discredited the the source or the uh, the data. However, even if we just take the data for what it is, I feel like there's so many people that are trying to get into Airbnb that, like you said, there's way more listings active this year versus last year. There's more people coming into the market. And I feel like one of the most common strategies for Airbnbs for their first year on the market is to price extra competitively to get as many five-star ratings and super host status so that they can then increase price over the time. That's one thought. And the other one might be, we're looking at May, which I wouldn't denote as being like the main <laughs> travel time frame like there's still a lot of you know kids in schools families not starting fam- summer vacations yet i'd be interested to track this over time to see is this a blip of time of a lot of new listings coming on board keeping prices low to get those reviews mm-hmm. that would just be like if i was trying to be the devil's advocate of the yeah. data to see what's actually going to go on because i guess on the other side i always feel like there's avail there's a lack of availability of Airbnbs here in the Milwaukee area. So maybe we just haven't been hit with that, uh, you know, huge increase in availability. Be interested to see where it goes. And I also wonder, because we've had more conversations with, uh, you know, home sellers that are, I have a two and a half percent interest rate. It's a single family. I've got enough for my next home down payment. Should I just keep this mm. and then just go buy my next home? And I'm like, well, let's look at the numbers. I wonder how many people in some of these top destinations have thought the same of, 
maybe they've relocated, maybe they've moved to a different area and they've kept it as an Airbnb. Interesting. And maybe they're non-experienced operators that are just trying to hold on to that interest yeah. rate long term. Who knows where the this inventory is? The accidental landlord. Yeah, the accidental landlord, which I think there's just more and more, and people are seeing that as an asset. If, even if I even just break even, I don't even care about the revenue. Right. If it pays my mortgage with, you know, in this case, if my mortgage is 3000 bucks a month and my Airbnb covers that, why would I Great. sell? Yeah. And you know, they might have a 15 year mortgage that they, you know, refied at two and a half percent. They're just going to have an asset here and you know, you know, 15 years, it just totally paid off. So who knows mm -hmm. if the numbers even matter as opposed to from it being a pure investment standpoint. Yeah. Interesting. Um, what else you got? It looks like you got another Airbnb article in here. What's going on in Milwaukee? In yeah. The Airbnb so space. Yeah. I think like this great segue into the next topic here. Um, Milwaukee, it's on the docket for them to review regulations for Airbnb. It's been proposed to review in a meeting in the future. <laughs> proposed to review. So about as like infancy stages as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, there has been, excuse me, influxes of Airbnbs in Milwaukee, like in any city. Mm -hmm. This article goes on to talk about how there's been more like nuisance citations and more mm -hmm. activity at these Airbnbs because of people coming in, being loud, being noisy. Um, and so it's basically on the docket to be reviewed to create some sort of regulations. What that yep. looks like, it might be like certifications that the Airbnb host has to do. It might be a tax that the Airbnb yep. host has to pay to the city. Um, I live in the east side of mm -hmm. Milwaukee. The I live in a duplex. Um, the house next to me is an Airbnb. Yep. I, we're flipping a property. Yep. This is like three weeks ago where I come back from the flip. I have like dirty clothes, toolboxes, been doing demo for a couple hours. And there is a massive rager happening at this Airbnb Bumping. next to me. Yeah, it was like a Tuesday night. Um, it reminded me of like being in college and going to college house parties where there's, there was literally a line out the door. Um, <laughs> at midnight, I could hear they all sang happy birthday for someone. So that is like my personal experience. Also, though, Shaking like, your fist at them. <laughs> Dang, kids. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, so we'll see where this goes. You know, I think, though, in general, Milwaukee is trying to be really attractive for people to come and visit too. Yeah. And the mayor has very lofty goals of increasing population in Milwaukee and making it more of that destination type city. And so I think that if they are to create regulations, I don't see it being harsh enough that's going to deter someone from creating an Airbnb just yep. because they want Milwaukee to be a destination city. Yeah. I've, I've kind of stood behind that as well. Totally agree with it. And in all honesty, I think it was, we kind of like looked on the, under into this article, one of the concerns that like local homeowners have on this is because people are paying more for these homes because there's like a rental potential on them and there's a return potential, it's causing some tax value assessments to come up. Mm. And that's where you kind of said like, okay, should there be more taxes incurred or some sort of fee, you know, passed on to these people that are using them as non -oak on non owner occupied yeah. to, you know, make up the difference for them growing the price of the value of these homes, which could impact affordability. It could impact, you know, the taxes that people pay uh, from people using these investments. So mm -hmm. interesting to see where it goes. We'll definitely keep a, keep a, a feeler out on that. Otherwise we've got some of our national topics. So I've looked at this a couple times and I'm trying to figure out, you know, exactly the right way to present it, but we've got uh, from Zillow, they create a Zillow home value index, which is essentially the measure of a typical home value and the market changes across a given region and housing type. This is reflective of essentially the typical home, which they're defining as the 35th to the 65th percentile range and how values are going up over time. Here are the top three, Richmond, Virginia, Miami, Florida, and Milwaukee, Wisconsin at a up 4.3% in terms of the home values going up over time for just the typical home mm -hmm. in the market. So they're adjusting this for like seasonality, those things. So I thought it was interesting. I think what we saw before is that Milwaukee is one of the sev seventh hottest rental markets. Mm -hmm. We know here anecdotally that it's just super competitive. We saw, you know, eight percent about 8% growth in median price. And we're seeing it in Zillow data as well that we are one of the third best markets in terms of values going up over time. So yeah. just a really cool piece of data I saw. I mean, there's a bunch of other places in here. None of them are, again, kind of those sexy markets. Yeah, which it's is the Midwest kind of Rust Belt sections that we're seeing grow yeah. other than Miami. And if we, yeah, Miami, definitely a, an outlier there. Yep. Um, but yeah, OKC, Oklahoma City, yep. Cincinnati, Philly, Kansas City, Hartford, Baltimore, Columbus, St. Louis, Cleveland, West Virginia Beach, Detroit, Louisville. Like they're not these like crazy glamorous cities, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's, 
it, it's kind of like the story that we've talked about, like the last couple episodes, mm-hmm. is that where we're seeing the most stable markets are these markets that you don't think of when you think of U.S. cities. Yep. I'm kind of surprised Chicago's on here, actually, at 2.4%. Yeah, totally. And these are greater metro areas. So you never know, you know, even if you're seeing some slowness in like the metro, you know, the downtown area, yeah. there's a lot of people that are choosing to move into the suburbs as we kind of have that creep out there as people do still have hybrid as an option to work. So they're just going into the actual downtown area less frequently. So another good little stat there for the Milwaukee area. Otherwise, another great month in terms of inflation update. Uh, we came in just about 3% for total inflation. I believe it came at 4.8% for the core inflation, which is essentially removing the volatile you know, food and in energy sections. The main thing driving uh, inflation today continues to be shelter, up 7.8% versus a year ago. I'm starting to get to the point now where we're at 3%. Not quite at the two percent Fed target, which is you know their kind of you know uh, line in the sand that they've drawn. At some point here, we've heard that rents are coming down from you know more real time sources like Zillow or from you know Redfin and all these other data sorts that collect more weekly data. What do we think is going to happen next with this inflation once shelter starts to come down? I mean, if shelter comes down, that's going to be a huge yeah. needle mover Deflation. for over. Like for overall inflation, yeah, because yeah. I mean that makes up a huge percentage of what inflation is, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, if we look like nationally at home prices, if we look nationally at rent prices, typically they're going down. Yeah, but also though with interest rates where they are, interest rates being steadily around seven percent, this includes mortgages, mm-hmm. right? Um, I believe that it's mostly for the the rents as opposed mm. for like the the home prices in there. Yeah, because even though like home prices are going down, I think a large part of this because mortgages are locked in for such a long period of time. Yeah, mm-hmm. I guess like what I'm thinking is even though home prices might be going down, mm-hmm. people are interest rates are going up. Mm-hmm. So if you have a budget of let's say three thousand dollars a month to pay for your mortgage, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter what that home sells for because you're probably still gonna be paying three grand a month because of where interest rates are. Yep. So it's also quite possible that you know, even though home prices decline, does that necessarily yeah. mean inflation's going down? Not necessarily, because people are still gonna pay with where interest rates are. But I guess it depends like how they're measuring that, you know? Yeah. I, I think a big piece it is like home prices go up and usually rents lag as a result. We're seeing nationally prices come down mm. on real estate, which means that maybe people are a little bit nervous that they're not going to get their units filled. So we have this temporary, you know, settling of rents. But if we continue to see rates stick higher for longer and we have investors buying at higher interest rates, they're going to pass the cost on to renters one, two years down the road. Yeah, interesting. So do we have this little tiny little, you know, I guess uh, trough that's going to essentially resume back to the normal of seeing rents, you know, increase 3% year over year, which is, you know, historical. I Worst think it'd be man, yeah. interesting to see once we actually start lapping some of the shelter stuff, knowing we've gotten the real time data of rents coming down. And this, as what I've been told, is kind of lagging. It'll be interesting where we go next. Yep. We also got the chart here. It's been impressive to see how fast we've come down from a year ago. We're essentially, you know, at less than half of way more than less than half of what inflation was a year ago. We came down faster than what inflation actually went up, which I think is very interesting. Again, sitting at 3% total inflation. <clears throat> so moving on from there, again, we continue to see and a strong- is this month over month, this chart? No, that's year over year for this. So it's each month, year over year. Mm-hmm. Okay. So essentially we saw inflation drop 1% each month versus a year ago. So April at almost five, then we had May at four, and now we've got uh, May, or sorry, June, April, May, June. We've got June sitting at 3%. So if we add up all these bars, that's total inflation year over year. Not from a percentage change perspective, but from like... Yeah, so it's essentially, yeah, each year what how price is related to a year ago. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. And moving on for the... So like... One of the things that people are kind of looking at is inflation is something the Fed monitors. Unemployment continues to be pretty strong, uh, depending on like what charts you're looking at. Mortgage rates have just been sticky, sitting right here around 7%. I think the biggest thing we to call out is, yes, rates are still at 7%. There's still a spread between where they could come down to being of about anywhere from 1% to 1.5% that we could see them settle. 
but that's based on us getting potentially softer data in the labor force, which we just have not seen no. yet. It continues to be super robust. I think what's most important that we're watching here on the mortgage rates is how we compare to a year ago. Because what we've seen in some of our own clients is about anywhere from five to 10% of every client that might buy a home or buy an investment a year ago might actually have a change of life circumstance and then sell the next year unless they're just you know tightly packed into this really great interest rate. This time last year in June, we're sitting at 5.75% interest rates roughly, only about a percentage difference, which monthly payment wise here in our area is probably gonna be you know anywhere from 150 to 250 bucks, to, depending on your purchase price. It's becoming more reasonable that somebody could, if they're gonna mm. walk away with some equity and some proceeds from their sale, they're not locked into their home for anybody who started buying in June of last year and we'll lap 7% interest rates in October. Where does the market come next where we actually have home sellers that could come into the market that aren't just locked into 2.75% interest rates anymore? Yeah, because, it's pretty interesting. It's, it seems like, mm -hmm. I think I saw 75% of Wisconsin homes are under a 4% interest rate, Yep. but it's like the longer that these interest rates stay at seven, the healthier the market almost gets to a sense because mm -hmm. then you have more people that are willing to sell your home. Yeah, and actually have a, a fluid, you know, more fluid operating yeah, market where people aren't as worried about the interest rate that somebody got a year ago. It's that base effect. It's yeah. what we're comparing to a year ago is what matters and it actually ends up trickling through customer sentiment. Even if like, again, people talk about gas prices all the time, they don't even care necessarily what it was last year. It's just like, oh, it was 350 a month ago. Now it's 325. Great. Great. Yeah. The gas prices came Are down. Are down? <laughs> yeah. So I think that's one thing that like we have an advantage as people get more and more used to essentially this, you know, last six months of essentially six and a half to seven percent rates. You just get used to it and eventually you lap it and we get more people that are selling their home and buying a home that are just trading from a one price point to another, as opposed to trading to one price point and an interest rate mm -hmm. to something significantly higher in their monthly payment, because that's what people live off of. So it'll be interesting to monitor that. Yeah, what I'm also kind of staying close to and watching is when the Fed started raising interest rates, it put a lot of stress on the banks. And we saw several banks that really imploded because yep. of that too. And I kind of thought that when that happened, that the Fed would be a little bit more aggressive reducing rates, which mm -hmm. we have not seen that yet. Yeah. And so I do wonder if more months go by, the impact that this is going to have on the banking industry too. Yeah, just you know, as they get to you know maturities and some of the investments that they've made that are medium term as opposed to the short term, it will be definitely interesting where that goes. But I guess what we've seen as well is who knows you know, when mm -hmm. that stimulus that they pumped in just to save a couple of those banks actually hits. Obviously, there's going to be a lag to that. It will definitely be interesting to see all these like weird convoluted things yeah. that we have going on. But overall, I feel like sentiment feels good. And you know, when people feel good, they continue to spend money and it chugs the economy along. And mm -hmm. we're still seeing that in housing too. But moving on from there, what do you think all this, you know, Metro MLS stats, as well as like the news we, we kind of talked through, what's this all mean for our clients starting with buyers? Yeah, I mean, for buyers, I think you're still in a situation where less inventory historically yep. than what used to be available. If you're a first time home buyer, you won't know any different. Mm -hmm. But if you're someone that's maybe buying your third or fourth home, it might be something that you notice. But if you're looking to have success finding a home, kind of what, what we spoke to earlier, is mm -hmm. you've got to really own that process. Yep. and you've got to really be diligent about seeing your search, mm -hmm. going into homes, understanding too. I think like the first three to five showings you go on, it's more just for you to understand what is my budget? You yeah. know, like what do I need in a home? Is Honing this Honing okay? in your needs and your wants. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that's also like vital as part of, if, especially if you're a first time home buyer, to really understand those first three showings, take it all as just education, yep. you know, because after those three, uh, we kind of have the same strategy where we talk to buyers and we say, okay, rate this on a one to 10. Yeah. And I always think it's funny the first time I'm with a showing with someone, they have no idea, which it's how always else a seven. would you? It's you always know? a seven, unless it's really bad, then it's like a five. And they're yeah. like, ah, no, we didn't like it at all. And then it's like <laughs> the second showing, the third showing, it's always like, actually that first one we saw, that's now an eight or that's yeah. now a six. Yeah. But you need to have that education of process. compare and contrast. And the sooner yep. that you can start that, the better, because you're just gonna be more equipped to buying a home too. Yep, and what the stats show in terms of the new listing activity, the active inventory we have out there, 
and the somewhat more predictability around interest rates buyers are going to keep sticking around and we're likely going to see that five to ten percent appreciation for the next year that impact to you could be another twenty five to thirty thousand dollars that you're paying for the same home a year from now mm -hmm. so like, that cost of waiting is real and if you really want to break down the analysis and what it means to you, like it's definitely a good time to reach out and understand. We've got all kinds of great spreadsheets yep. to walk through and see if, like, if that's your long-term goal, it's time to start talking about that. Another solution we've seen buyers work through is essentially like we talk about investing in house hacking, you know, buying a duplex, living on one side. I'm seeing more clients be open to combining households with, you know, I've got a client where it's a, you know, it's a, a boyfriend, girlfriend, and then one of their siblings. I've got a guy and one of his buddies where it's like one of the guys is buying it, but you know, his friend is already planning renting as soon as they close on a place because their friends like they're finding ways to make that monthly payment more palatable mm -hmm. and starting their home ownership journey sooner and more comfortably. And what they can do in a year or two from now, maybe when they have the chance for the refi or maybe they get growth and income, which we might see in today's labor market. Mm -hmm. They just boot that person out and they've yeah. got their home. Yeah. So, you know, you don't need all three bedrooms, one and a half baths just to yourself. Yeah. A lot of people are using that hybrid kind of, I'm buying a single family home. I'm going to rent out one of the bedrooms. And that's totally fine. That's what people used to do more frequently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, um, I would say it's kind of unfortunate that that's kind of the situation that we're mm -hmm. in now. Um, I just learned that I think it was in the 60s or 70s, the average home price would be about one year of someone's salary. Yeah. And now it's closer to three to five years of someone's salary. But people are getting creative mm -hmm. where I have same kind of story. I've got a lot of clients that I meet with that are looking at single family homes. They mm -hmm. ask about like my history, my story. I share that I bought a duplex from the other side. And they're like, that's actually like super cool. Can we do that? And yeah. I think like financially, you're setting yourself up for a lot of success if you're open to doing something like that or opening mm -hmm. open to renting out a spare bedroom. Um, cause it's just offsetting your living expense yep. and someone else is paying down the equity of your asset that way. Yeah, totally agree. I think people are getting more and more creative and finding ways to make it work. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that are going to be benefiting from that a few years from now. So Ty, what does this mean for sellers then? Well, more of the same, uh, you've got gold in your hands here because, uh, where we continue to see low inventory levels. I think your biggest consideration right now is the interest rates. Um, and how it might impact you, like where did you lock in? More and more, that's gonna be a little bit less of a conversation, but I think the biggest thing we always call out is how you execute your listing really does matter. That's, are you picking the right price? Are you making sure there's not any like obvious like deferred maintenance things or maintenance things to, to take care of before you list your home? Make it nice and clean, get good photography, and time it right. Don't list it right before the 4th of July weekend. I think uh, I think we got ourselves some clients, some good deals because people Definitely. listed it going to the Fourth of July weekend when there's not as many people out shopping, and we actually got a, you know at least one offer accepted without competition that was a pretty good listing yeah. overall. Yeah, it just didn't have the competition behind it because of the way they executed. So yeah, make was, sure you hire the right expert to get it listed correctly and with the right marketing plan. Yeah, I agreed. I was on a kayak with my family on July Fourth when I got that accepted offer, and so <laughs> yeah. it's it's very true that the seasonality yeah. and when you do it is very dependent on what's going on. Um, I would say too, that it's very important to have an agent that you're working with or a team that's going to market your listing correctly. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we do that is pretty exciting that I think sets us apart from other listing agents is we took a, a, a page from Hollywood and market homes very similar to how Hollywood markets their movies. Yep. Um, just how a blockbuster movie, you got a teaser, a yep. trailer and the launch. We take a very similar approach. And our whole goal is that using the same approach of teasing that home, creating more of a trailer and then actually launching it, that by the time launch comes, we have a line out the door of buyers that are ready to see your home because they've yep. been anticipating getting in there with a buildup leading yep. up to it. And so with the strategy that we use, our whole goal is to not have that market, that, that home listed for sale very long, but to get mm -hmm. really strong offers right away. Yep. And that's something that I think is very important that when I see a lot of listings that aren't listed in a way that they should have been, it helps our buyers because yeah, there's less competition. They're listed to be listed as opposed to be listed to be sold. So we sell homes, we don't list homes. Mm -hmm. Like that's the whole thing of our team is like the active approach to getting something going is super critical. Yeah. Okay, 
what's this mean for investors? Like we, I think the headline here is two straight months in a row here where versus last year, median prices have gone up 15%. It's going to put a little bit of squeeze on cash flow. Yeah. What's, what's all the things that we're seeing right now mean to investors? I'm, I'm with you there. There's absolutely still good cash flowing properties, good cash on cash return, good cap rate deals to find in Milwaukee. Um, the prices have gone up slightly though. And so I think it's understanding and maybe tweaking the numbers and what's realistic and what you're after compared to yep. even three, four months ago. Um, but there's absolutely still good cash flowing deals out there in the duplex space and in the multifamily space. It's getting very, very difficult to find good flips. Yep. I, I like very hard. I work with a lot of clients that we are busting our are behind to find <laughs> flips and it's difficult. Yeah, I, I think anecdotally what I've seen over the last month or two, very similar to on like the traditional buyer side is I've had a few people come back, you know, kind of raising their hands and going, I thought interest rates were gonna come down. I thought prices were gonna settle. I'm back in. I just can't wait any longer because I can't keep kicking the can down the road because I'll just never become an mm -hmm. investor and start. So I'm starting to see a little bit of demand actually come back that are just coming to terms with the interest rates. So as these interest rates stay higher for longer, people are getting more used to understanding what we talked about earlier. If it's break even, at least I'm getting skin in the game and buying a deal that I know I'm not going to be underwater on, mm -hmm. but they, they want to start capturing that 15% growth year over year too. And there's yeah. going to be more demand and there's still very low supply. And, and there's a lot of people that are going to hold on to these, especially in the investment space, because you don't have somebody who's like, Oh, I, I moved from one place to another, so I've got to sell. No, they're just going to keep it if right. they move and put it in property management, or they already live out of state anyway. Yeah. And I also talk with a lot of investors too. On your first deal, you want to find a good, safe property. Mm -hmm. You know, like once you scale up, if you think about like an investment strategy of 401k, you're going to have a mix of some stocks that are high risk, high return, mm -hmm. some that are just safe in bonds. Mm -hmm. And the same applies for your portfolio and investing as well, too. And it's yeah. very important, I think, for your first one to get your feet wet, get the have base. enough return where it makes sense for your time, but it's not gonna be a grand slam deal. It's gonna be a yep. single or a double, and that's okay. Cause that's yep. gonna leave you with a good taste of wanting more versus the flip side. You go all in on something mm -hmm. that looks like it has really good returns without truly understanding the nuances, the locations, mm -hmm. everything that is involved with investing. And you end up in a situation where you're like underwater, yep. deferred maintenance catches up to you, a can that's been kicked down the road is finally now in your lap that you have to take care of today and you end up selling or whatever happens and you're yeah. like, I'm never doing that again, yeah. which is a horrible experience and something I don't want any investor to have to ever be in that boat. Um, so it's okay, I think, for your first deal to have moderate returns in a really good, safe yep. property. Yep, and if you're feeling uh, the pushback and wanting to pull the trigger, it's because you either need a little bit more education, you might need a little bit more information of just honing the information you have, not more information necessarily, but how do I understand the information? And sometimes you just need more capital to make yourself ready to take that risk and know that you've got a backstop there to protect yourself. Like those are the things that you need to actually take action. Definitely. Otherwise, what's new? Uh, what is new, man? I've been doing some traveling here recently. Yeah, uh, you I was down in Austin, Texas. Had okay. uh, a pretty fun event flying back um, Sunday night. Landed in Detroit for a connection. It's 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. Flight gets delayed to 10 p.m. Great. Nine o'clock rolls around. 9:30 rolls around. Flight gets canceled. Great. This is Sunday night. Had quite a busy Monday morning, so ended up booking a rental car, driving from Detroit to Milwaukee. Got home at 2 a.m. Um, I always think it's funny though when this happens. You know, it was like a giant storm that came through the whole Northeast that day, and people in airports. I think you kind of see a lot of true colors of people in airports, and yep. also like. People do things in airports that they'll do nowhere else. Like flights get delayed all of a sudden. It's like you're in like a lawless society of people like plugged into walls, sleeping on tile floors. Yeah. But my favorite are the people that are like, I'm never flying Delta Airlines again. And it's like <laughs> as soon as you're booking a flight somewhere and that flight is cheaper than anything else, I know you're going to be on that flight. Yeah, totally. Yeah. How about you? Um, over the uh, you know holiday weekend, Fourth of July kind of stuff going on, we, we kind of putz around to the sandbars. So that's uh, Wisconsin River. You know, set up a tent, had some beers, had spike ball out. You nice. know, I was playing some spike Love ball, doing some floats. So, you know, just getting out and enjoying the uh, holiday weekend and, you know, cranked out a couple of showings before we went out there and, you know, was still supporting, you know, clients from uh, from there from on, the on some pretty crappy Wi-Fi. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, can't can't complain there. Anything uh, you've been uh, reading or watching, any new shows, anything going on that uh, – you're just doing fun this summer? Any recommendations? Uh, TV show-wise, Sopranos. Okay. Uh, the Gabagool. 
The, I've, I've never seen it. No. Um, <laughs> so I recommend. It's it's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Um, it came out like in the '90s, 2000s, and there's a character in there who's Tony's son, Anthony, and he's the same age as us now. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of cool seeing that like what he was experiencing is what we would have experienced at the same timeline too. He's wearing a lot of like Slipknot shirts and like skater <laughs> yeah. shoes, you know, which was just the style in the '90s. Also, just an incredible show. Um, yeah. And then I just started watching The Witcher as well, too, the new season. That was going to be three. mine, yeah. Um, what do little, you think, season three? It's good. You know, it's the, fine. It's, it's very, like, fantasy and, like, very, yeah. like, goblins and, like, creatures. And so if that's not your thing. Like, you will not be into it. But, yeah, yeah just Good storyline, good character development. I like the first two seasons. This third one, they've broken into two parts. Yeah, and when I does feel the like new part come out? I have no idea. I, have, I, I honestly was like, wow, the third third season's out. And I saw it was like five, five episodes. episodes yeah. And, yeah, I feel like they it was like essentially a teaser season to get ready. So the next you know next half better be freaking baller. Because I just finished episode five last night. Yeah. And I was like, what's next? Right. <laughs> I'm like, this can't be the end. Yeah. A little bit of cliffhanger there, but... Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of what I've been watching too. I, I finished uh, uh, How the Mighty Fall, uh, oh. you know, one, from that series of uh, Good to Great, uh, you know, uh, Built to Last, and then How the Mighty Fall. So that was a little bit of reading I did over the holidays, you know, nice. some business book reading. But Fun. that whole series is pretty cool, and usually you can get a lot of it out just like the uh, the summary of each section will kind of give you things to look out for. But I thought that was all super interesting as well. Nice. Well, with that, if you found value in the information we just covered here in the Milwaukee area. Please subscribe, hit that bell notification button so that you know when we post our next market update. Thanks, and we'll be back next month with your Milwaukee real estate market update.